Here we go. I'm going to grab my pen that actually works. Okay. Because I will take some notes. Okay. <laughs> Should have said that before you hit record. That's okay. That's no. okay. I edit. So we're good. <laughs> we're All good. right. Ready? Um. Yeah. Let me just write down that. Monday, three to four thirty. If you go to enlightened leadership lab.com, okay, you can take a look. And okay. and the, the forward slash invite goes specifically to that. Okay. Perfect. Done. Okay, okay. cool. Ready? Yes. Three, two, one. Hi, everybody, and welcome to episode 182 of Circle Up and Get Real. At 182, Dan, oh my gosh, you know, think about that. <laughs> Sometimes I go, wow, we've been doing this for a long time. Um, this podcast has been really fun because it's very interactive, obviously, podcasts are, but it goes where it goes. And you reached out to me, I don't know, a couple months ago through some connection. I don't even remember what it was. How did we connect? Uh, Ryan Goodman. Oh yeah, that's right. Ryan Goodman. So people in your past, in your future, in your present are, it's so fun to to notice mm -hmm. connections. Yeah. And that's how I met Dan. And we met at a coffee shop and we just had a conversation about cool things. And it turns out that Dan is my people. Mm -hmm. And what you, what we talked about, Dan, is perfect for this podcast, Get Real, because it's all about uh, your journey in leaving a secure position as you know we we do as budge uh, what am i saying as as burgeoning adults we do mm. what we're supposed to do the way we were conditioned to do it and something in you said ah, there's something else mm -hmm. yeah and so i'll tell people who who you are just a brief overview so dan he'll tell us more about how he got here but he is the founder of confidad which is a membership organization for parents. Is it more than dads? Is it moms too? Or is it mostly? Yeah, dads? it's it's whoever will opt in. Okay. Yeah. So whoever whoever is like, yep, this is my people. This is for me. Yep. So it's a community of parents mm -hmm. who want to have the experience for their kids that maybe they didn't have as kids. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's kind of how you got there. So Dan, I'm gonna let you take it from here. How did you get here? Who are you? How how did you come to this? space in your life? Well, it, I mean, we'll start at kind of the beginning. I'm mm -hmm. the youngest of four and was raised in a wonderful, safe, healthy home. Um, we all, you know, no perfect family. We had our issues, but um, for all intensive purposes, we were, I mean, it was good. It was a great childhood. You know, I knew I was loved. I was safe. I was fed. I had tons of opportunities as a, as a kid to do sports and music and theater and, um, and hunting. I mean, it was kind of this like, uh, Renaissance upbringing of whatever I wanted to do. My parents tried really hard to make sure I had an opportunity to do it. Um, and yet there were moments where I was like, gosh, I know I'm loved, but I don't think you know me. I don't think you, you see me. And oftentimes I don't feel heard as a child. And, and so then I just kind of assumed that's what, that's what kids experience, right? Like it was, be seen and not heard when mom and dad had people over and things like that, you know, like that was a very common mantra of that generation. And, um, I've seen memes on line about like parents in the nineties. And I was like, that is exactly my upbringing, you know, like yelling out the window time for supper. We're out running around the neighborhood doing our thing. Um, as I got older and my, my siblings went into junior high, high school and I, we moved out to the country. I had a lot of time all by myself. And so didn't have any kids in the neighborhood to play with. And so I spent a lot of introspective time as a kid. I didn't really know what that was back then, but a lot of it. And, and I came to this realization that like, I knew I was loved, but I, but I didn't feel necessarily wanted, or I didn't feel like I was known to the deepest level of who I am, not because my parents didn't want to, but because they didn't have time, right? They were busy, they both worked full-time jobs. My mom was a night nurse. My dad was a teacher and a coach. And uh, and my siblings had needs that they needed to meet as older kids do. And I was just kind of this self-sufficient young kid who, unless I was making trouble, didn't take a lot, a lot of attention. And so tried that, didn't love it. 
you know, one, one suspension in school, um, uh, because I made a stupid mistake and that was it. I was like, Nope, not doing that again. I'm going to be a good straight A student and do the thing. So I, I, I jumped through all the hoops. I went to college, met my wife. It was fantastic. Um, got into music ministry and youth ministry <clears throat> and a lot of outdoor stuff. So rock climbing, camping, hiking, we moved to Arizona, um, and I worked at a church down there while she was getting her master's degree in social work and spent a lot more time in church work and outdoor ministry, music ministry, and then landed this gig as a, a youth worship pastor, which essentially I play guitar and sing, lead the band for four services every Sunday morning between two fifth and sixth grade services and then a junior high and a high school service every Sunday morning. And it was bonkers. You know, I'm running between buildings at down in Arizona, there's no hallways, right? So it's like run from this building to the next building, do this service, run back, finish the other one. It was crazy, super fun. Uh, I loved it. Cut my teeth in music and really kind of owned my musicianship. Before that, I was kind of just a, a talented vocalist who was a hack on guitar and it made me really build that skill up and it was fantastic. So things changed. We had a baby. She's looking, my wife's looking to stay at home. It's like, okay, I guess I better find a job that supports the family. And so about 10 years ago, a little over 10 years ago, we ended up coming back home to Fargo Moorhead. And I got a job at a church here that I had, I had been to a couple times in college singing in a vocal jazz ensemble, but never really had any touch points and, and got hired on as the, the first full-time worship director that they had had in a, in an almost 60 year history. And they had two campuses and um, big volunteer teams. It, it was great. I loved it. Super fun challenge. And I served there and loved it and hated it and did the best I could. And I don't say hate in a bad way, just hate and like, you know, everyone's got the things about their jobs that they don't love. And so, um, I, I ate it up and I, and I worked really hard, went to seminary, got a degree, uh, went to a worship school specifically and learned a ton of things. And that's where kind of this self-awareness piece started cracking open mm -hmm. um, and through a couple other processes and, and groups, I ended up um, coming to this place of going, gosh, I, I, I kind of thought this was my dream job and I would do it for 30 years or 40 years and, and then be done. But like, I got that job at 27 and three years in, I'm like, I don't think I was dreaming big enough. Mm. Like my dream was to be a full-time musician in the church or traveling, whatever it took to provide for my family. And I'm like, I'm, I realized that dream at 27. And I was like, gosh, I don't really, you know, maybe I wasn't dreaming big enough. And that's kind of like in the back of my mind. Well, I'm loving my job. I'm very much appreciated. People love what I do. They are feeling blessed and served and, and honored and all this stuff. And so it was, it was such a great gig, but I, I had this beckoning feeling inside. That's like, Hmm, this won't last forever. Mm. And so that was maybe six, seven years into it where I was like, oh, okay, I know there's an exit coming. I just don't know when or how pandemic, you know, everything is online. Mm -hmm. We're doing music videos for, tr it was wild, right? Like <laughs> very, very hard season, lots of work, lots of confusion, lots of heartache and hardship, um, like everyone experienced. And so it really kind of made me ask the question, like, is this what I want to do for a profession the rest of my life? Cause um, I've always, <laughs> I was going to said, like, when we ask our kids, what do you want to be when they grow up? Like, are we talking about like kind, generous, thoughtful, right. considerate, or, or is being what you do? Because right. that's what it is. It's like, oh, I want to be a police officer, teacher, doctor, lawyer, whatever. So like with my kids, I'm kind of annoying about it when they're like, what do you want to be when you grow up? And they're like, eh. and I was like, no, that's what you want to do. Right. That's the profession, but we are human beings not human doings. And so how, how can we find our way in the world? Like how can we be in the world that's different? And maybe it's, it's linked to or connected to what we do. And hopefully that's true for a lot of people. They find passion and joy and fulfillment in the profession yeah. and it's linked to who they are and yeah. how they want to be. But like, I, I trying to help our kids ask that question. They're like, dad, what are you talking about? And I'm like, just trust me, trust me, trust me. Yeah, yeah. So, so let's go back a little bit because this is exactly, these are the existential questions that a lot of people probably have, but don't allow themselves to dig into. Mm -hmm. And I want to go back and, or come back to this, but you had one daughter, you're in Arizona, you were 27, you went back to school, you did all these mm -hmm. things. 
tell me about your family, how it grew in this process. Cause you now have four kids. So yeah. how did that, what was the order of things? Well, uh, so it's funny that you say daughter, cause we have four boys, but he has long hair like me. Oh, and everyone, gotcha. thinks, Sorry. everyone thinks he's a girl sometimes. So it's, you haven't even seen him and you think he's a girl. Uh, no, <laughs> we have, uh, four boys four and boys. he, he was born in Chandler, Arizona. Then we okay. moved back uh we like buy our first house in december and turns out we were pregnant when we moved in we just didn't know it and so then mm -hmm. that next august we had another baby mm -hmm. another baby boy and then um and it was like every two years baby baby okay. baby uh and so i think i had i had to like miss one seminary intensive class because we were gonna have a kid okay I was like, I could come to Chicago and miss my child's birth, yeah. or I could just zoom in. And they're like, right. zoom in. I was like, perfect. That's what I was hoping you'd say. So yeah. um, I did that. And then uh, the last boy was born. Uh, they're all summer birthdays. And then the last one was born the day after Christmas Day, which for anyone that knows anything about church, uh, like Christmas and Easter are the big, those are the big moments where everyone shows up that doesn't go to church all year, all right. year round. And so like, we see those as big opportunities to serve more people. And so I had to plan a Christmas Eve service as if I wasn't going to be there. Mm -hmm. And I'm like the main worship leader. So I have two other worship leaders that are, you know, on, on the team with me and come Christmas Eve. They're like, why are you here? I was like, I don't have time off yet. Cause we <laughs> baby's still like inside. It's yeah. not, you know, in the world. So, um, that was kind of funny. So we had our whole Christmas Eve, Christmas day, and then had Christmas day dinner with family. And then that night it was like, we could barely get to the hospital before mm. he was born. Uh, and so I was all excited to have a kid finally have uh, a birthday during the school year. And then he's born during like winter <laughs> Christmas <break>. vacation. <laughs> yeah. Oh, so, that's great. so, and, so you've just described right there, Kind of the conflict um, in church being one way of, of serving and having a job and doing the things um, you said, people said to you, why are you here? And you said, because this is what you do. This is my job. This is how yeah. it works. And I think yeah. we get that mixed up a lot in the world of work because we have been trained and conditioned a certain way. This is what you do. And right. while the kids came every two years, you were still, it sounds like juggling the thing that you thought was your passion and your joy with this new passion and joy, which is a yeah. growing family. Um, I yeah. think that's probably how you had these um, existential questions occur for you. And I also want to go back and ask a question before we go too much further. When you were a little kid on your own, introspection was mm -hmm. important to you. You were telling me that you were asking yourself questions um, when you were a little kid. Did you know that at the time or was that in hindsight when you could say as an adult, wow, I was thinking about these things as a kid. Do you remember? I remember, um, like I always knew I was thinking the questions, right? Like the, the questions were always there. And I even had teachers tell me like, why do you ask such deep question, right? Like I had a high school teacher tell me, I can't wait for you to leave and go to college because this is physics mm. and you don't get to ask these questions in physics in high school. I was like, why? And this sounds arrogant, but it's just true. She said, the questions you're asking are confusing the other students. Mm -hmm. And I was like, well, I'm not like, I, and I'm not like valedictorian, most brilliant kid. Mm -hmm. I just was never afraid to ask questions. I, I was like, I could just be here looking for answers that I could find in the textbook. But if I come up with another question as an instructor, I saw that is your job is to help me find the answer. And, and it was, you know, there was tension there and, uh, and that's fine. But as a kid, I, I knew that um, like, you know, kind of an old soul, right? Yeah. Like the kids that you're like, what are you like? How, I never thought of that question, you know, and, and one of our boys is that way too. Cause like, he's been in the car riding with friends and, and the dad's like, your kid listens to every single lyric on the songs we're listening to. Do you know this? I was like, yeah, yeah. So make sure that you're listening yeah. to the stuff you want, you right. want him to hear. Cause he's going to ask you the questions. And if you're not ready, uh, just watch out. Cause mm -hmm. that's kind of the environment we've created in our home is to say like, no questions off limits, our dinner table, anything's open. That's where we talk about our stuff because if it's not safe and comfortable to talk at our dinner table about hard questions, weird questions, silly questions, where is it? Right. Mm -hmm. Like they're going to go find a place where it is safe and hopefully home is that place. Right. Well, and I, I remember you asking, I feel like I'm not seen. I feel like I'm not heard. Mm -hmm. That's not something that typical kids 
are aware of, I don't think. Maybe they are and they just don't have a context for it because your yeah. story, we when we met, your story is my story. Yeah. And I just didn't know other people had that same experience. I mean, there's a really like visceral moment. I remember being at a concession stand. My sister was a gymnast. And so we were at the gym all day long on Saturdays, all winter. And, and my dad was a wrestling coach and I wrestled, but not like I didn't do varsity till later on. And, and so like, as a young kid, like fifth, sixth, fourth, fifth, sixth grade, and I'm also pretty short in stature, like I'm five foot four, haven't grown since eighth grade. So I've always been kind of the short guy, uh, which I'm fine with, but um, being that small kid in line in a concession stand, everyone assumed I was someone's kid mm -hmm. when I like had my own cash in hand waiting to make an order. And it was like four, five, six adults. And I finally was like, Hey, do mm -hmm. you see me? And they're like, Oh, I thought you were that person's. And I'm like, no, cause I've been standing here for, you know, five minutes waiting for you to ask me, what would I like? And, and so that was a very like, it always came up like I'm not seen. I don't feel seen. And so I think part of, you know, like I, I took the Enneagram personality assessment probably six, seven, eight years ago. And, and it, what it does is helps you discover who you had to become to the survive your story. Mm -hmm. Right. And so I, I identify most closely with the, this core type of seven, which is the enthusiast which the person who is like exuberant, fun, looking for adventure all the time, that's kind of the joy side or the, the light side. And the shadow side of that is like, I hate pain, hate it. Mm -hmm. Avoid discomfort and pain at all costs. So making jokes when things get awkward, you know, entertaining and uh, intellectualizing whatever it takes for me to move from awkward to comfort or from mm -hmm. like from sadness to joy um, or I probably should say sadness to happiness, um, a little less deep way of saying joy, but, right. um, that's the piece of like, okay, I had to move from here to here in order to survive. Um, but then be, then having that awareness and looking back, like I always knew I felt these this way, but now as in an adult, as an adult, I was able to kind of put the words to the experience to mm -hmm. be able to iterate and go, okay this is exactly what I was experiencing. And now that I have these words, I wonder if other people are experiencing these same things mm -hmm. because the whole reason that I founded Confidad was because uh, my own experience and then also hearing, working in the church, hearing other parents having very, very similar experiences in raising their own kids and understanding like, you know, for a, for a while it was like, dads didn't say I love you to their kids. It was like the tough, you know, like, I'll tell you, I say I love you once. And if it changes, I'll let you know. Yeah. Right. So now that culture is kind of that that's kind of softened. And it's like, no, I love you, honey. I love you, honey. I love you, honey. But sometimes and in many families, the lived experience of the child is not matching the words coming out of their parents mouth, specifically dads a lot of the time. And so what I'm working towards is helping parents learn how to see and hear their kids because as you see your kids in their environment and their interactions, as you hear what they have to say and what they want to contribute to your family, that leads you to knowing them in a core level. And, and as parents, it's actually our job to know our kids better than anyone else. And that's hard because they spend more time with teachers and daycare providers than us parents. So how do we accomplish that? So it's like started looking back on our family, like how did we develop this culture of knowing, of seeing and hearing our kids? We don't do it perfectly. I'll be the first one to admit that there's no such thing as a perfect parent. But what we're trying to do is develop a handbook for ourselves to say, how can we bring these kids from childhood to adulthood without making them like skip childhood, mm -hmm. but also feeling so safe to come and ask all the hard questions, all the weird, awkward, weird, goofy questions that kids have where I'm not shaming them for asking a question. Yeah. I hear that so many times when a, when a kid comes in, I was like, why do you care about that? Or why would you ask me that? Mm -hmm. Or who even cares? Who even knows? Like what that communicates to the kid is like, oh, mom and dad aren't the safe place to ask the question. Yeah. And so then if they can't ask questions, they can't find their way in the world. They don't even know who they are. And so then they have to go somewhere else to find their identity, to, to discover who they are and what is so core in their being. So my job, my, my dream, passion, everything, the reason Confidad exists is to help equip parents to know their kids at such a deep level that when they say, I love you, the kids are like, 
darn right you do because my lived experience is matching the words coming out of your mouth now. And it's a big task, but it's that marginal improvement day by day by day, just little things, uh, little tools and tricks and, and ways of getting to know your kid so that you can write your own handbook. Right. That's so important. There are so many things you said in that. So if you're listening, listeners, go back and, uh, you know, replay that replay what Dan just said, because if you as a parent, and by the way, I have to say, I have no kids, so I'm not a parent. I don't come <laughs> at this from the parent's perspective. The only perspective I has have is the daughter's. Mm -hmm. And your uh, description of your upbringing is very similar to mine. And my parents did the best they could with what they knew as well. Mm -hmm. I believe, I'm going to always say this, I believe and assume positive intent all the time. So I'm yeah. going to believe that every parent out there is doing the best they can with what right. they know. But it, on your website, you have a lot of information and it's not a knowledge gap that we have. There's a ton of knowledge and information out there. You could read anything anywhere. Mm -hmm. But the gap, it seems, in what you're talking about is the experiential gap. Like, what mm -hmm. are you really ta tapping into as a parent when you are being confronted by a kid's question? Because that's about mm -hmm. you, the parent, not about the kid. Right. right. You said mm -hmm. earlier that the teacher who told you you're you're disrupting the other kids or you're confusing the other kids was the teacher's way to cope with all these kids. How? Do, what mm -hmm. do I do? The teacher did the best she or he could with what was happening in the present. Right. But that affected you in mm -hmm. a way now that is allowing you to take that lived experience and support others. And yeah. I love that. Yeah. And I think one of the other kind of core operatives that we, uh, I don't know, we, we just take it in as, as truth, especially in the West is, um, is understanding like independence is the ultimate goal. Uh, we are called to raise our kids or we're asked to raise our kids. The whole thing is to get them ready to go out into the world and be on their own mm -hmm. independence. Like, listen, independence is a myth. It's a like, you didn't milk the cow that you used for the milk in your cereal this morning. You didn't, you didn't like harvest the wheat and thresh it. And all, no, there's no such thing as true independence unless you're off the grid. And then you're not listening to this podcast because you're off the grid doing the thing. Right. Okay. There's true independence, but it, but it most 99.999% of people don't get raised and don't live in that sphere and yet in america in the west we talk about independence and freedom as being like the culmination of the human experience and so i see that in parents who are like nope we're gonna raise them up and it, and it's almost like they're pushing to the to that extreme of like i'm gonna push them to independence early and then you have the other extreme of people who are reacting to that to, that that it they just coddle and and it's it's like the helicopter parent which is really codependency Right. Like I'm not okay unless you're okay, but that's not apparent. Like we don't find our okayness. We are not grounded and steady by the state of our kids. Like we're, we're the ones that are supposed to be grounded and steady so that our kids can have the volatile emotions. Our kids mm -hmm. can have the dysregulation and we help them come back into that green zone of being regulated in their emotions and walking through the hardship of kids, like a kid's life and childhood. We're supposed to be the steady rock. And so codependency is not the goal either and that and that's just as disruptive and confusing for kids as this independence thing so what i teach is is helping parents and kids become interdependent if you think of it like there's the thing no man is an, an island but for this metaphor this illustration let's think of ourselves as an island and in your family you have bridge connections like across the water to each person in your family. And when a baby is born, that bridge is like a rope bridge. It's very, very fragile. It cannot hold a lot of weight. And we as parents are carrying everything from our island to theirs and then taking everything back, you know, like taking or uh, carry and carry out for all you campers and backpackers, right? Like we have to take care of all the things for these babies because they can't do anything for themselves. As they grow up, we're building this bridge stronger together. It slowly becomes a boardwalk bridge and, and, and they start to carry their own weight as we have, you know, chores. We call them contributions in our house because language matters and chores just has a negative connotation, but 
can you contribute to this house? Can you contribute to the wholeness and health of this home? Yeah, you can. So let's work that in. So they're building stuff and, and then it kind of becomes 50, 50, right? Like as they get older, it's like, no, you know, I can fill up your water bottle for you before you go to school, but you're 11, you also can. So instead mm -hmm. of asking me, can you fill up my water bottle? Just go do it because right. you, that's fine. You contribute to your success and your health today by doing these things. So and then eventually the goal is to get to like a Golden Gate Bridge style relationship because when you are there, it can carry the heavy weight of truth. And it, coming from the church, I hear people all this time, share, share the truth and love, share the truth and love, share the truth and love. And I'm like, you're just bombing the bridges mm -hmm. of people who are not ready to hear the conversation that you're bringing. Now I, I'm a Jesus guy. I'm all in on the gospel of Jesus Christ. I think that he has come to save and redeem all people and all creation to take care of all sin and suffering and blindness, like, like the goodness of the kingdom of God. That is, I'm like all in on that, but I'm not all in on the evangelical tactic of overtaking the world, uh, you know, colonialism, all the stuff that like the church has been coupled with. There's this beautiful part of how Jesus has called us to live that we humans have taken and like most things humans touch, uh, it becomes consumable and something that it isn't meant to be. And so um, as we move into that place of like having trusting relationships, you can have the hard conversations. I mean, people talk about, you know, well, when, when are you going to have the sex talk with your kid? And it's like, it's not one talk. Mm -hmm. It's, it's a part of the human experience that we just talk about, and like our, our kitchen table is the place where we talk about all of it. Mm -hmm. And if we don't talk about it, someone's going to talk to our mm -hmm. kids about it. I don't care if it's drugs, sex, rock and roll music, I, like all the touchy things. Mm -hmm. It's like our kids want a safe place to ask these questions because they're running into it. So creating that bridge that's strong enough to carry the weight of those conversations so that when they get to adulthood, we are interdependent. We know the other part about interdependency is no knowing your own strengths and living into those strengths and knowing your weaknesses and then asking for help, mm. right? We say it takes a village. It's so much easier to say those words than to actually call up a friend and say, I, I don't know what to do. Mm -hmm. I'm at the end of myself and I need help. Mm -hmm. And yet there's so much power in that humility, what the world would call weakness. There's mm -hmm. so much power in asking for help and saying, I can't be all things to my kid. I can be this and I can be that. And I know that I'm strong here, but in my weak areas, I'm going to need help. And how encouraging for this other person, it doesn't even have to be a parent, just someone in your life that you know and trust that you see strong in that area to say, come cover for my weakness. Yeah. That shows your kids true interdependence. Right as humans depend on one another to make their way in this world and to then to grow and flourish. So then your kids go, I know I'm really good at sports or I'm really good at competition. I'm really good at, you know, intellectual problems and math and what like, but I'm really not good at being compassionate when people are mean to me. Mm -hmm. But I see this person and every time someone's mean, they just turn around and say, it's okay, I love you. Or mm -hmm. it's okay, I know that's coming from a place of hurt in you. And so I'm going to choose to just not let you have power. So as we see another person be strong in that area, it teaches our kids to go, how do you do that? How, how do you forgive that person so quickly? And they're able to say, well, I they probably want to hurt me because they're hurt. So yeah. it's not worth just continuing the cycle. So the idea is like, it's not... It's not complex. It's pretty simple, but it's not an easy thing to come to that place of building that bridge. And, and what a lot of millennials and Gen Z, I believe, have experienced is that push to independence and a pretty much a rope bridge, maybe a boardwalk bridge with their parents. And then by the time they go, either they throw a bomb and blow it up or the parents are like, but wait, I thought we were gonna. And then the bridge blows up. Yeah. And, um, and how do we not have that happen now? Um, spoiler alert, I'm, I'm 37 and my oldest kid is 11. So like, I haven't been there, done that. So I'm not this parent coach on the en other end of it being like, look at me with all my wisdom. What I am though, is a person armed with good questions and good experience. And I'm in the thick of it. Mm-hmm. 
Like I was talking to a parent the other day and I said, I think sometimes parents forget all the hard things they went through when they are empty nesters and they just sit back and go, Whew, what a ride, good or bad. Uh, what a ride. And then it's like on to retirement and, you know, margaritas in Florida or whatever. And, and I'm like, uh, I'm here to help you because I'm in the thick of it too. And I want to help our generation raise kids who are interdependent they are humble, kind, confident. They know who they are and they can carry that into the world with confidence. If they know that they want to be kind and generous and philanthropic, they're going to move into a profession that embraces that, right? Like it's so much more important to know who they are in their core and who they're becoming so that that can lead them into a profession versus, oh, I just think it'd be really fun to do this. I mean, like, why do they all, why do so many college people change majors? Students change majors because they have no idea. They're like, I want to try that. They take three classes. They're like, that's terrible. I'm not going to do that. And then they mm -hmm. shift, which there's nothing wrong with that. But what if parents could help their kids know themselves so deeply and so well that they just, they encourage them in those moments of questioning to say, Hey, what if you tried this? What if you helped them move into that place? So Yeah. A lot there that is so relevant to the world we live in um, as adults, because I'm mm -hmm. a leadership coach. So I think about the people who come to me, had they had the experience you're describing right now as either a parent, a young parent, or as a, a child, mm -hmm. we would be in such a different place in our corporations, in mm -hmm. our organizations, right. because there would be this sense of confidence and truth. What mm -hmm. I hear you you talking about is sharing your lived experience and partnering with what you know to be true. And as you do that, you said, I'm not perfect. I don't have it all figured out. My kids, my oldest kid is 11. We're not on the other side of this yet, which I think makes it all the much more um, relevant today and mm -hmm. forever. Because yeah. you will have shared experience that continues as your kids get older. Yeah. So this is such a great transition because we could talk forever and we have, Dan, before, <laughs> but we and we will again. Um, so you you indicated that there's a community element, a village element to raising kids who are well-rounded. Mm -hmm. Um, I know what you're doing with Confidad has a lot of a lot of moving parts to it too. Do you want to describe yeah. a little bit of that? Yeah. So there's three core pillars to the products that we offer. And so, um, there's, there's a course, an online course that is, it's a, a five week, like 40 days. I'm not like all into numbers and perfect endings and stuff. So that frustrates a few clients, but that's okay. Like that's just who I am. I'm yeah. like living into the, into the, this was the content that mattered and here's how it's organized. So here we go. 40 days, but it's been 40 days with me engaging with my course to change the next 40 years of your life. That's the, and it's not like an overnight, oh, I just spent 40 days and my life is forever changed. It's no, like I'm equipping you with perspectives and questions to ask yourself so that over the next, you know, however many weeks that your kids are in your home, you're doing marginal improvement, incremental improvements day by day to go, no, I'm building this family culture that I know my kids are going to thrive in. And that my, my partner, if, if you're married to your, you know, your kids, other parent, whatever, however your family, mm -hmm. like I'm not judging. It's like, not everyone's the same, right? That's the thing It's you need to know your role. And our, part of what we do in the course is help you name the role that you play in your parent, in your kid's life. So if you're dad, if you're mom, biologically, if you're adoptive, foster, grandparent, guardian, uncle, whatever it is for these kids, like you have to own your role because only you can own that role. Mm -hmm. That Like kids only have one person in that role. And, and even if you, even if you have two moms or two dads, like you, the way that you are dad or you are mom, like that's the only, you're the only person who can fit that role. Mm -hmm. No one else can do that for you. So know it, embrace it, own it and flourish in it. Mm -hmm. That's the goal, right? And so the course really helps parents become self-aware into how did I become a parent? Why did I become a parent? So many parents are parents and they didn't ever ask the question, why are we doing this? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's just like, this is what we do. Like we get married and have kids and, and have a family. That's what everyone does. Right. And then, you know, you're two years in and you're like, no one told me this was going to be 
impossible. No one told me there's no handbook. I mean, maybe I heard that, but like I've read the books and they're kind of helpful, but like you said, information, if it equaled transformation, we could all read a book and have a six pack or whatever your desire is, you know? <laughs> um, and so the coaching is helping you come alongside with the information to allow you to see that transformation because coaches, what our whole job is helping you identify your blind spots and then work on those things. And it's going to be uncomfortable. It's going to be hard. It is not easy, but what discomfort are you willing to go through to make sure that your kids have the best childhood and that you are the best parent that you can be for them? Like, isn't that worth any price? I know business people pay 25 grand for a masterclass so they can be the best business person. And they're like, oh, but the, you know, the return on investment is, you know, I made a hundred thousand, fifty, whatever. Like, okay, that's, you can measure that. It's much harder to measure the parenting thing. And so mm -hmm. I think that's a hard piece. That's like, how do we do it? But like, when I have a client say, when my kids are being defiant, I used to just yell. Mm -hmm. I used to just say, do it because I'm the parent and I said so. And through your course, I've come to a place of going, oh, uh, I need to see them and hear them and understand why they don't want to comply and come alongside them and whatever is going on in their life, in their heart. And he's like, I've had more compliance ever since coming down to their level and being with them in those moments than I ever could have imagined. Mm -hmm. And he's like, and I don't have any guilt for like yelling at them anymore. Like, yeah. it's like, yeah. I, I get to be with them in that hardship and say, what's going on, buddy? I, let's talk about this. And as they do, and and it's okay. Like it's a parent's job to say, it's okay to not want to. You don't have to want to do your homework. You don't have to want to contribute to the family, but you still have to because you are in this family. Mm -hmm. Like this is who we are and what we do as a family. So it's a non-negotiable, but I understand that you don't want to. Like the both end piece instead of either or, like it's huge. And and our kids, our kids know it already. Mm -hmm. We have been conditioned to believe that everything is either or, but the I believe that kids are born with the both end. They're able to carry it. And we parents are like, we can't handle the either or so or the both end. So we have to push either or on you. So uh, if that doesn't make sense, call me. We'll talk about it. I know. Um, <laughs> So well, and, anyway, and just to let you know that I end up teaching those things to business executives because they didn't yeah. learn it when they right. were young, like you are teaching them. What would happen right. if they all of these foundational, fundamental, um, essential skills were part of their beingness mm -hmm. so that they didn't have to go through a doing to get back to the being and finding that that's right. what's happening in, in my work. Right. And I think it's interesting because because. So many adults, so many have pursued their profession or career or whatever to prove to mom or dad that they are worthy of their love. And then when they do that, and then it, it doesn't, you know, and sometimes it's not even spoken. It's like, no, I've already, I've always loved you, whether you, no matter what you do, I've, I, I'm always proud of you and I'm, you're worthy. And like, I, you know, so as part of it is just teaching that communication too between parents and kids and helping them know that like before you do anything, son, before you do anything, daughter, I love you. I'm for you. And you could never do anything in mind. Yeah. Like that is a power statement in a kid's life. Because mm -hmm. then they know well, no matter what I do, I can screw up the worst I've ever screwed up. Yeah. But like our goal is to create such an environment that when our kids do screw up, they do the thing, the worst thing that you could ever imagine. They come running to us instead of running from us. Yeah, very good. Because um, they're not going to learn anything. They're not going to learn anything running away. Mm. It's just going to be more damage and more collateral and more hurt. And oftentimes it's not just them. There's other people that get hurt by the process versus coming to me and saying, okay, like our, our one of our sons, he loves what everyone else has. Call that coveting. <laughs> and he came to us three <laughs> days ago and he was just like, his countenance was just like, I'm so sorry. And we're like, what happened, buddy? What's going on? He's like, I just really like what all my brothers have. And for the last three months I've been stealing. Oh. And I'm like, really? 
okay, tell me more about that. He's like, I just really love it. And I know that I have to wait a long time to like do contributions and get allowance and the things that they have cost a lot of money. And so if I was, I'd have to wait like a year to get it. So it's just easier if I just steal it Mm -hmm. and hide it under my bed. So he like Mm -hmm. crawled under his bed with a headlamp and drug all the stuff out that he had stole, all the things he wishes were true about him, all Mm -hmm. the things he wishes he had, he drug them out. And one by one, we laid them in piles and we had him give them back to his brothers Mm -hmm. with an apology. And I said, here's the thing, buddy, they're going to be mad and they might not forgive you yet because you hurt them. Mm. But it doesn't mean that what you're doing right now doesn't matter because what you're doing right now is so important. You are apologizing, you're owning your mistake, and you're saying, I'm sorry, please forgive me. That's Mm going to repair the relationship way quicker than if you just like rehide it back and then you're holding all this internal shame and guilt. Right. So anyway, uh, how old is he? Uh, he's seven. Oh my goodness. Wow. Yeah. And so it was a really visceral moment of like, okay, this is like, you could see it in mm-hmm. him. Like it was so deep and, um, to see him come out of that. And like, he just, it was almost like he had a weight off his shoulder. Mm-hmm. And we've been wondering for a while, like probably last three, four weeks in hindsight. Now you go, Mm, that's what, like he's been screaming outbursts out of like out of nowhere and we're like where did this come from mm-hmm. and since now it's only been a couple of days but since he gave it back he's had zero outbursts wow. and oftentimes those are like those be- behavior is communication in kids mm-hmm. always we want to like punish and control their behavior but really they're just trying to tell us something they don't have words to say yet mm-hmm. They don't know how to get it out because they're too young and their brains aren't developed, but so they're doing it with their bodies and we are getting all like bent out of shape. Like, Mm -hmm. I can't believe my kids act like this. Shut up. Like, stop thinking about you. Mm -hmm. All that, all that is, is about you thinking, what are people going to think if my kid acts like that? Yeah. Yeah. Tune all those people out. Who cares what they think unless they're in your village? Uh, cause that what they think matters, yeah. um, and tune into what your kid is saying through their behavior. Yeah. So anyway, what I was saying is we have a course, we have coaching, which is like group coaching or one-on-one coaching, depending on what, what I've found with a lot of people is like, this is such a course sensitive thing that they worry about being found out. Mm. So like one-on-one coaching is like, okay, I think I gotta do that. It's like, well, I price it at a place where it's uncomfortable because, if you're going to do one-on-one coaching, I want you to really think about, is this actually what I need? Because most of us need each other more than we think. Mm-hmm. And so group coaching is probably the best for most people. Cause you're going to end up going through this cohort for 40 days with other parents and go, Oh my gosh, brilliant. I'm so glad you said that. I'm so glad that you brought this to mind and to light because I'm experiencing the same thing. And Oh my gosh, I thought I was alone. Mm-hmm. Right. And so beyond coaching and, and, the course, it's uh, a community. And so I have a monthly masterclass that meets on the third Tuesday over lunch uh, on Zoom. And and it's a time to come together as parents and I'll teach concepts similar to what I've been talking about today um, every month. And then also give an opportunity for people to share like, what are the victories you're seeing in parenting right now? And what, what are the places you're stuck, mm-hmm. right? Like let's celebrate things and let's get through stuck moments together. So great. So great. So if people wanted to find out more and connect with you, how would they do that best, Dan? They can just email me, dan at confidad.com. Head to my website, confidad.com. Um, those are the two best places to reach to reach me. Um, I'm also on LinkedIn, Facebook. I'm, I believe I'm the only Dan Tinquist in existence right now. Okay, great. <laughs> so you can't miss him. So you can't, un- unless you spell my name wrong, but uh, yeah, there's the, the Tinquist family is, is a big family, but there's not a lot of Tinquist. So okay. um, Swedish roots going back that way. And I guess when my ancestors came over, they used to be Johnson's and there were so many Johnson's coming from Sweden that, uh, you know, traveling across a field, I think in Maine, they saw the name Tinquist and they, decided to take that name instead. Well, there you uh, go. And that was my, I think it was my great grandparents, uh, my great grandfather's family. He came okay. over as a boy and, uh, and settled in Northern Minnesota. So nice. anyway, 
Nice, nice yeah. little history lesson in there too. Uh-huh. So you guys, if you've heard anything, um, moms or dads, dads or moms, I'll say, um, mm-hmm. that you want to connect with, uh, Dan is just a joy to have a cup of coffee with. And you can do that virtually or in person. If you want to join his community, there's a lot of resources on his website, confidad.com. I'll put that in the show notes. Dan, thank you for taking the time. Um, I'm always just enlivened by being with you and having conversations with you. I don't even have kids yet. We still connected so well when we first met. So um, thank you. Thank you for taking the time. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. It's been a a pleasure and a privilege to be on your podcast. Thanks, Dan. And so everybody uh, reach out to Dan and as always get real. Talk to you again. Bye.